Hi, everybody. My name is Maura Hudson. I am Senior Managing Director for Corporate Services with Newmark Knight Frank. I am also the co-chair of the Real Estate Facility Management Chapter, um, along with our um, other <coughs> peer uh, relationships with um, ISS, uh, Colliers, Cushman & Wakefield, also JLL, and also um, Procter & Gamble. Uh, we have, you know, over 75 to 100 members specifically on, focused on real estate facility management um, with more that attend as part of our chapter meetings and webinars and also as part of the Global Summit. And we are always looking for um, more members to participate and collaborate on our LinkedIn page, which you can find by searching under IAOP, Real Estate and Facility Management. And uh, one of the features of this chapter is to produce webinars on a variety of topics. And this one we're pretty excited about. Um, it is a very um, hot topic. Um, it's covered not only just in real estate um, circles, but also in any uh, working environments where companies are looking for different kinds of managed space um, outside of their own, own portfolio. And uh, they're, so they're navigating this new world of being able to access this in um, a different variety of ways. So um, I'm going to turn this over to our chief facilitator who's going to lead off our discussion, Dusty Dismars, and um, he will introduce the rest of the panel. And um, we'll turn it over to you, Dusty. Great. Thank you, Maura. Happy to be here today. Thanks to uh, IEOP and all that has uh, been involved in planning this. Um, yeah, we're going to kind of dive right into the topic today. I um, wanted to introduce the panelists. Um, in fact, uh, I'll just kind of We'll uh, roll off this slide here. Steve Todd, um, great expert uh, in, in many things. Uh, Steve is currently the Senior Managing Director of Real Estate and Workplace Strategy for NASDAQ. Uh, he sits in New York. Uh, Fred Gordy, uh, Director of Cybersecurity for Intelligent Buildings, an Atlanta-based consulting firm. Uh, great, great group here. Ryan Chatterton, we're, uh, I think he's, I, we'll have to ask where he's logging in from today. Uh, it's somewhere uh, in uh, some, somewhere in Europe, I think, founder and chief editor at Coworking Insights, uh, and he's the marketing director at uh, Habu, uh, based uh, in a few different places. Uh, like I said, and myself, um, I uh, work with Mara at uh, Newmark Knight Frank. Um, I'm on the Connected Places Practice Group, which is uh, housed in Global Technology, our innovation and solutions uh, team. So happy to uh, be here today. Uh, maybe uh, in, in light of time, we'll just kind of dive in, and I think you'll, you'll learn actually what a lot of these folks do by um, uh, speaking on this topic, if you will. And we're uh, excited here, but I think to kind of set a baseline, um, Cornet Global has used this um, definition of co-working. Uh, according to the Oxford Dictionary, co-working is defined as the use of an office or other working environment by people who are self-employed or working for different employers, typically, uh, so as to share equipment, ideas, and knowledge. And I think that's a pretty um, standard definition, if, if you will. Um, I, uh, I, I want to make sure we, we did define it. I deal a lot with uh, technology, and co-working can really um, mean a lot of different things, right? In fact, um, uh, it's now being defined as your, a your AI counterpart in the workplace. So that could be a future webinar at, at some point, but we are talking about the WeWorks, a lot of the different uh, vendors out there who are providing these, these spaces. Um, and with that, we wanted to just kind of touch on a, on a, on a couple trends, if you will. We, um, Newmark did a white paper a few years back that really focused on the, on the New York market um, and the explosive growth of, of these environments. Um, again, kind of as New York goes, as a, a number of other cities follow, right? So um, not only the square footage that they uh, occupied since 2009 had grown almost 800%, um, 180 plus locations, again, that was uh, that was uh, up as 86%. The square feet um, average size uh, was also increasing. I mean, the, the overall city portfolio, just we work alone, increased by 6,258%. It really... Um, it's, it's explosive growth. Yes, it represents only uh, a small percent of the market at this point. Again, at the time of this graphic, it was 1.2%. It's probably still less than 2% um, total right right now. Um, 
And we see part of that growth is, is trending as this particular um, option is, is becoming more attractive to enterprise users, right? Um, Newmark also put out this paper not that, that long, a few, few months back this, this year. Um, you know, these centers are now uh, locating closer to enterprise user headquarters. And so we're, we're starting to see kind of a natural progression of um, how they're, you know, I think it was WeWork said that a good 30 plus percent of their customers now are actually enterprise users. And so the shift from our understanding of these gig economy uh, type folks who are just kind of uh, doing a graphic design firm and maybe they got three or four spaces or so on and so forth, it's, it's much broader than that at this point. We're going to talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, we, uh, again, looking at some of, some of those reasons specifically, um, one, one that, um, you know, for years we've been involved um, in what we call global enterprise optimization. So really looking at any company and how they are laying out their, their space, right? What is, what is their overall strategy and cost? You, you can't, you, you can't ignore it, right? Um, we've, we've used that metric in the industry for years of, you know, $10,000, uh, per desk per, per year as a, as a rough estimate, right? Well, in certain markets, that could be 15, 20, or possibly even $30,000 in a London, San Francisco, New York, um, so on and so forth. And so the, the fact that you could potentially put some of your employees in some of these spaces, I think I was on a, a website not that long ago that a decent New York, uh, just, just a guaranteed seat at one of these places, maybe not, I'm, I'm not putting my, my photos there necessarily, but a, but a guaranteed office was, you know, roughly $450 a month. I mean, if you are doing that on an annualized basis um, or, if, or if you're getting kind of a group rate, um, you can kind of see why some of that cost is there. Flexibility too, right? You're not having to sign up that, that long lease term and that's some, somewhat of an obvious one. There's, there's some additional layers there. But I wanted to turn it over to Ryan Chatterton um, to talk about some of the other benefits. I mean, what – Going back to this explosive growth, which is really represented globally, I believe, um, what are some of these other benefits of these spaces? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Dusty. Um, yeah, you, you're right. I, I am not in Berlin anymore. Um, I'm actually in a, a town, Banska, Bulgaria, which is a ski town by winter, and there's a co-working <laughs> space here, which is where, I, where I'm calling in from. So, um, nice. yeah, I mean, I think you, you hit some of the main benefits on the head. Um, I mean, co cost and flexibility are probably two of the reasons people think of uh, the most, but a couple I wanted to add in um, come under the convenience category. So um, I think it's important to think about location. Um, if, if you're opening up a new, if corporates are opening up a, you know, uh, what, what we're seeing a lot of is uh, corporates kind of creating these innovation teams uh, inside these co-working spaces, um, which touches on another benefit, which I'll go over in a second. Um, but uh, location is really important if, if you know, you, you can spend, I imagine, I, I don't come from the corporate real estate world, but uh, I can imagine you can spend months uh, trying to find a suitable location uh, where you're going to move in a team. Um, and uh, that's a, a lot of saved time. If you just uh, locate inside of a co-working space, the, the space is already typically in a great location. A lot of them are very centrally located near public transit. Um, so that's, that's a really great uh, convenience benefit there. Uh, the other convenience benefit is infrastructure, um, not having to outfit the office typically, especially if you're kind of just doing um, kind of a short-term thing or a testing ground for a new team in a new location, uh, not having to set up the internet or maybe having to do a, kind of a, your own layer of, sec of internet security on top of the existing internet infrastructure um, is a lot less than having to go through the entire build out uh, and fit out of the space. Uh, often they come furnished um, and they, as mentioned before, there's, in the definition of co-working, you know, the shared use of equipment such as, you know, printers and uh, and even just things like kitchens and stuff like this can uh, be a huge convenience. Um, I think another benefit that people don't uh, don't think about and, and potentially could also be a downside if you think about it um, is talent acquisition. Uh, lots of these co-working spaces are filled with very talented individuals uh, that possibly work at other companies, but a lot of freelancers and solopreneurs as well. Uh, so I think that... Um, along with the talent acquisition comes exposure to new ideas and technology and projects that people are working on. So uh, talent acquisition is a, is a really interesting one to look at. Um, you know, as your, as your teams are mingling with other people in the co-working space, 
naturally over a cup of coffee or something like this, they tend to get to know the other members in the space. Uh, and who knows, you know, you might find a, a really good hire um, naturally through that. I know that, uh, you know, talent acquisition is a, is a, uh, a lot of work for a lot of large companies trying to find developers and, and great marketing people um, and ops people. Um, uh, there's also the, the potential for, you know, acquiring acquiring companies that are working inside co-working spaces. So I just wanted to quickly go over, those are some of the benefits that I think about uh, for corporates locating inside shared workspaces. Huge. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've known there, there, there's there's such an ecosystem of, of different companies in, in some of these. Um, I liken it to my early days in property management. Um, I was a building manager at a 47-story building, and sometimes um, I had a tenant on the 30th floor that didn't even know, um, but somebody down on 15 uh, provides a service for exactly what they, they need. So even just within the building uh, you know, system, you could, you could find somebody. So in these co-working, it's, it's very similar, and um, yeah, I, I'm going back to even 15 years. I remember part of HQ and uh, Regis. You know, for years, you, if you just have a sales office in some market or whatever, maybe, maybe you start small like that. Um, but let me let me ask Steve, um, Todd. Uh, we're we're going to get to your kind of larger story of of how you guys um, kind of approach this decision. But with some of the comments Ryan shared, is that is that are, are those consistent with Nat's, uh, NASDAQ's reasoning for kind of getting into this space? They, they are, Dusty. Um, but also I'd go the reverse because some of the benefits for some organizations may, may get. NASDAQ may have a different perception of that. So some of the amenities, um, access to printers and so on and so forth, because of our security protocols, we actually wouldn't want access to those things. So while there are benefits for some users, uh, we're quite the opposite, and primarily due to our technology infrastructure and also our security protocols. But in essence, yeah, the, the flexibility, the, the cost, um, short-term commitments, et cetera, absolutely the benefits are, are part of motivation, part of, part of what motivates NASDAQ. Sure. No, that that makes sense. Thank you, Steve. I'm gonna advance the slide a second here. Um, <clears throat> I I myself, um, again, calling in from a home office, I have used the Liquid Space app um, to access some of these centers. Um, I've, uh, you know, depending on the market that I'm in, um, I can land on the plane and um, you know access a private office with a lot of these. Amenities. It's. Um, it, it, I, I'm assuming most of the folks are familiar with this platform, but it's basically kind of like an Airbnb for office space and meeting rooms. So large um, co-working centers are, are listed on this platform, or uh, there are landlords with just a little bit of access space here and there, and it's furnished, and uh, they they can list their um, space on this platform and uh, charge a fee for it. So literally, I've touched down, uh, booked my space, paid with a Visa or, or MasterCard via, you know, via, via the app. Um, and actually in West Michigan, where I'm based, uh, I've used one that's uh, just, you know, fun. There's, there's, there's other people there. So it's, it's a little bit different from my, from my downstairs basement office, right? Um, in fact, I saw a kind of an article on that the other day. It, it you know, at the base level, people are are drawn to this stuff just to not be alone. And, and I think there's a lot of value in, in a lot of the things that we've talked about here. Now, now one thing that, that has come up, um, you, you're not seeing their um, people's decision to move forward in these spaces um, due to uh, very high uh, corporate IT security policies. They're, they're not purposely going into the environment with, 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 with that um, notion, if you will. In fact, there's a lot of centers that may, um, you know, have an open network or so on and so forth. We're, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on just network security necessarily today. Um, th there is a simple stat here on, on this slide that, you know, it, it, it's your company policy and, and 20, 5% plus are, are advising their employees. Again, this is whether you're at Starbucks, you're, you're at an airport, or you're working out of a 
co-working center. Um, you know, most companies are advising on uh, on this issue. Fifty uh, percent of those are encouraged to use a VPN. Ten uh, percent are advised not to connect. Again, there's lots of reasons we could spend time on today. That's that's really not what we were um, going for. I know my uh, IT. Uh, we are owned by. Tanner Fitzgerald and I, you know, I can't even connect to a hotel open Wi-Fi without logging into my VPN. I can't send or receive emails and so on and so forth. So that, that, that's more of a corporate IT decision, if you will. But I, I do want to open up the, the topic. I think what some companies might be um, a little concerned with, again, if they're just part of the, um, I know for my co-working center in Holland, Michigan, I just do the day pass. And so I can sit anywhere and there might be this perceived risk of, of shoulder surfing. Um, I'm in a city where uh, I've been uh, out to lunch with some of my colleagues at Herman Miller and they absolutely scan the room <clears throat> just to make sure there might not be somebody they know from Hayworth or Steelcases right up the street. You know, just, just you know, that, that, that risk is, is there. Um, a, 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 any of our um, panelists, have, have you... Uh, seen some of this taking place? Have you been in a situation, maybe Ryan, where um, you've been involved in the operations of one of these centers where something has arised, or is this just one of these things you, you kind of just need to be smart about? Um, I mean, when, when I've been running spaces, uh, it, it's never really come up as a, as a huge issue. I mean, typically the spaces I've been running have been more independently focused. Uh, lots of small companies, not working with a whole lot of corporates. Um, some, you know, startups, we have a startup accelerator in our space. Uh, but it is definitely tempting when you're walking past somebody's desk if they've got something interesting on their screen. I, I can't imagine anybody <laughs> who doesn't feel tempted to take a look. So uh, it's certainly a very real concern. Um, I think it's been a big deterrent for a lot of corporates to kind of enter the space, but I think there, and hopefully we'll get to this later, I think there's a lot of, you know, opportunities to uh, collaborate on this issue with co-working spaces to, to try to make it less of a, less of a problem. Sure. Steve, was, was that a concern for, for NASDAQ or in, in any of these spaces? Do you have kind of a carved out section of, of the space that's dedicated just to your employees? Yeah, we, we, we don't actually have any employees that would sit in an open environment. We also uh, we also tint glass, put screening over glass, so people can't just do what uh, Ryan suggested there. Obviously, uh, we try to keep everything very private, or we have our own private space with our own entrance. That's kind of what we try to gotcha. try to go for. Perfect. Well, I want to talk about some other risks that. Um, Probably most of us have not really thought about um, our cybersecurity expert, Fred, has been patiently waiting to uh, share some information with us here. And so, Fred, I'm just going to tee up this, this slide that has a few stats. Feel free to either walk through it or just kind of speak to this topic in general. You know, when, when we're either leasing facilities or we've got employees working out of these, these centers, what might some of the, the larger facilities risks be? Well, first, we, we've got to kind of establish how we got where we're at. Um, you know, everybody's heard the term IoT, which is the Internet of Things. But um, so to clarify, where I come from is I'm not an IT cybersecurity guy. I'm an OT, which is operational technologies, which fits inside this IoT category. And as the slide points out, a um, couple of stats there, but one of the things is that you should keep in mind in the next few years, we're looking at about 20 billion plus devices connected to the internet. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. What we've seen over the years, and and I've you know I'm an integrator, so I know how this stuff is put in, is these these all of these services that you find inside of a building. The the biggest selling point of adding smart devices was to make make a uh, ease of access, ease of use. Well, the problem is that ease of access and ease of use has made uh, things pretty easy for the bad guy. And the bad guy is continually looking for the weakest link. And they have figured out that most of these control systems are the weakest link, and especially the ones that are connected directly to the web. Now, I know we're talking about co-working and that kind of thing. I want to relay a, a story. There's a, a customer that we were working with out in California, 
even though you, the the people who are renting the space or whatever don't have any uh, don't have any oversight on how the building control system is working but it but the negative impacts could impact the company's ability to do work for instance this building in out in California they had a uh, parking system and the parking system uh, printer was exposed and someone got to it and they don't know whether or not it was a, actually a bad guy or a kid, but it doesn't matter because the end result was, was really bad. What happened was they printed to the printer, there is a bomb in the building. So everybody had to empty the building. They had to bring the authorities in. So there's lost work, lost producti productivity. Um, so what these companies are doing, and I'm glad to see this, but there's a lot of work still to be done, is these companies that are buying these buildings are beginning to say, okay, we need to take stock of what's there. We need to take stock of how it's been implemented. Uh, so we're working real closely with several companies around around the U.S. and overseas that um, helping them develop a, a process by which when they come in the door, they buy this building, they can go take a look at all the legacy systems and see where the vulnerabilities are. So it's Another couple of just yeah. Go ahead. Please. No, yeah. Well, it's just amazing how many. If you think about the building operations that that involves so many different subcontractors, and these people can yeah. uh, have full access to systems, and you just you don't even think about it. Well, and and to that point is you know again this this environment that's been created over the past twenty years. Um, a lot of times the vendors. I, I like to tell people you bought the building or bought the building control system, but you don't own it yet. And that's because the vendor, vendors typically in a building control system of any type have the majority ownership and control of that thing, meaning they have remote access to it 24-7. They, in a lot of cases, administer the users in there. Everything that's counterintuitive to the way that IT does things, <laughs> we've done it as bad as you could possibly do it. <clears throat> but... um the, the vendor, like I say, they own the system. Well, why is that a problem? Well, all you got to do is look at the statistics and see that third-party breaches are where most of this stuff comes from. The other thing is the misuse of the system. And what I mean by that is if, if in the IT world, if I had a server sitting there that was performing a specific function, I'm not going to let somebody sit down at that server and go check Facebook, right? Well, these front ends, as we call them, they're sitting in the engineering office, which could be controlling HVAC, which uh, elevators, lighting, so on and so forth. Those guys are typically using those systems to check Facebook, to check email, and that kind of thing. Well, why is that a problem? Well, I'm sure everybody has heard of ransomware. And in our industry, that is beco becoming more and more prevalent. We've seen over a 400% spike in ransomware hitting control systems. Well, why is that a bad thing? Well, yeah, the building may continue to run because the intelligence is distributed. The problem is if you've got critical uh, systems, for instance, we had a hospital group that um, the front ends inside of there uh, that were running the HVA, HVA system got compromised. And what that, the impact to that was they had to cancel surgeries, and that was over several campuses. We've also seen where uh, blood banks, where temperatures, somebody's just messing around, and they go in there and crank the temperature up above 80 degrees. Well, the blood, once it, the FDA, FDA requires it, once it reaches a certain point, over or under, you have to throw it away. Um, but then, again, like I say, the ransomware itself is we've created another problem in there is not a full-fledged disaster recovery plan for most of these buildings. And what I mean by that is you go into these buildings, when I do audits, the first thing that I notice is they're backing the systems up directly to themselves. Well, if you're familiar with what ransomware does, is it encrypts everything on that machine. So if your backup is being backed up to the machine that's controlling the building, you have no recovery. So you either have option one is to pay the bad guy, 
which I never advocate because you never know what they leave behind, or option two is rebuild it. Well, you've already paid to have it built one time. Now, what is that going to cost you? And all of these things, every every type of event that occurs, just like with the bomb in the building or locking out the systems and you can't control uh, the heat and the air inside the building, uh, all of that causes brand damage. And that's a, that's something you can't put a number on in the in the beginning stages. Yeah, obviously down the road, when either you're out of business or your uh, overall business has been negatively impacted, you're now down 75% of what you used to be, you could probably put a number on it. But you don't want to get there first, you know? Oh, my gosh. Yes. No, this is – unfortunately, folks, I think we're going to see or hear about more of this. Um, I'm, I'm not saying I watch Grey's Anatomy, um, but but I have a friend, um, and they just had an episode not too long ago where what Fred described basically happened on, on the show, um, again, according to my friend. Um, but it, it, it literally, yeah, everything you just described, all of the, you know, blood, and all, all of this stuff was going to be severely impacted and were they going to pay the ransom and all this stuff. I mean, this is, this is now hitting Hollywood. So um, as, as kind of crazy as this want, may sound. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, please, please try to go ahead. One, one real quick thing, too, is that one of the things that I didn't mention is I also do a lot of, there's a psychological aspect to this, and I do, uh, I'm the social engineering guy here. I try to fish people and I try to make you do things you don't necessarily think you would do. But um, there's some psychological studies that we're in a post 9-11 era. So what does that mean? Well, when you get into a building that's over, say, 10 stories and things happen that you can't figure out rationally, um, it can cause chaos. And what I mean by that is if I'm a bad guy and I get in and I uh, – turn your lights off and I lock the elevators. All I got to do is let mass hysteria take over. And when mass hysteria takes over and everybody's running down the, the stairs, you, now you're talking life safety. That's the other thing I wanted to mention. No, for sure. It's, it's a new day and age. Uh, we, we deal with a lot of uh, high tech uh, build outs, I guess I would say. And, and Fred is uh, Fred and his firm have, have been a phenomenal Partner, we're, we're we're dealing with uh, mobile apps that need to be prepared to uh, send a push notification for uh, disasters, um, active shooter. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a new day and age, and I and I think um, you know, just being aware of this stuff is 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 step one. We're actually going to come back to this uh, later in the webinar and and talk about some very specific steps, if you will, where I think um, you'll be able to actually take action on this. So given given that there are certainly risks of, of, of anything, and again, some of the things Fred talked about could apply to a building owner. It could uh, apply to anybody leasing space in a building that, that they don't own, co-working environment, so on and so forth. With with all the risks and with all the number of benefits that, that we've talked about, I, I'd like to take a step back and actually ask um, Steve, when when did this kind of come up in um, the real estate life cycle for NASDAQ? Was it was it a business unit that said, hey, um, you know, yes, thank you, we, we love this space here, uh, but we want to take this team and, and go into one of these centers to, to, to be more innovative? Or what, what, what was the dialogue that, that, um, that really prompted some of this for NASDAQ? Yeah, the, the, there's a number of reasons, Dusty. Some of it is as simple as we have a new product, new business that's launching. We don't want to commit to a new longer lease uh, and build out the space ourselves. So perhaps we go to a, a co-working location, build a team there, and allow into sort a of test case, okay, what is that experience like? That's sort of one avenue that which we've approached. Sometimes it's just been seeding challenges we've had in uh, a major city, say New York, for example, we have acquired a couple of companies and all of a sudden we have a, a seeding problem. So we go to a co-working space that can sort of ease that solution for us. There's also from the real estate team, some of the options that are actually on the marketplace today look very appealing from a workplace culture experience for employees. And NASDAQ's an organization that's grown through acquisition. And some of the organizations and companies we've bought have been very small entrepreneurial companies 
and we want to protect the integrity of that mindset. So they have actually come to us and asked, can we go to a co-working space to maintain that um, identity and not sort of be grouped and sort of swamped into the NASDAQ corporate culture? So there's been that sort of strategy as well. And also from a real estate team, we're just like, what can we learn from the design, from the use, and also the occupancy of these spaces? So what can we learn to bring in house for our own corporate corporate locations? And and the other side of it is, you know, we're going to, we just did it a vestiger a couple of weeks ago, and actually we're using uh, a lot of co-working locations to actually appease and sort of relieve tension, if you want, from that divestiture to provide uh, employees options who may work from home, similar to what you were just describing earlier, Dusty, an opportunity to go into a local co-working uh, location um, when the need arises for them or when they want to get out of their basement office, so to speak. So that's sort of the, the reasons why we have gone um, with a lot of co-working locations. I think within our portfolio, we have 65 locations. Uh, we are probably utilizing about 10 co-working locations currently. Um, and sort of like a quick sort of summary of the benefits that we have got from this. Obviously, you know, we touched on it earlier, but some of the things, as I said, is cultural shift, short-term commitment. But I think what's really interesting is the competition in the co-working space. It's almost promoting uh, these companies to compete with each other. Therefore, the product is getting better time and time again. So that's something that we're very, very interested in. The challenges we're seeing, which we've touched on before as well, is that you know, from a NASDAQ perspective, our technical infrastructure is very robust. Um, security protocols are high, so we're very cautious about the infrastructure that we put in place. And, you know, touching on what, we, you know, what was described before by Fred on the printers, you know, we won't print to a... a and community printer because that system, the hard drive that sort of records that document, we just obviously can't have NASDAQ documents going to there. The other challenges we've seen, and we've sort of, we find solutions to it, but it's obviously a lot of the seating is very compact. It's compressed. So we're actually, in cases, taking additional seats over and above um, what's been offered. So maybe on a two to one ratio, just so that we can provide some of our employees with that experience that we sort of want to give them while they're in that in that space. The other thing that we've sort of found uh, interesting as well is so you get two aspects within the organization. You get those people putting their hands up saying we want to go and experience the entrepreneurial experience of a co-worker and then we get other managers who are very skeptical and sort of see it as a short-term business and almost a step down if you want from a corporate environment. Um, and again, this is just different managers' mindsets, um, but it's something that uh, we, we have found um, to be interesting. And the other side of it, from from a NASDAQ perspective, there's no one outsourced solution that fits everyone. Um, and that sort of is, you know, in, in everything we try to do, we try to get to utopia of one one provider providing everything. Um, but again, it's it's sort of speaking at the competition level um, and location and geography that we that we operate across, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we can go to one size or one, one vendor to provide everything. But but I think those are some of the highlights of why we have chosen co-working locations and then the benefits sure. and the challenges. That is that is incredibly helpful, Steve. I think if, if anybody was to play back that last uh, three to five minutes right there, um, I think the explosive growth of these centers from corporates taking advantage of this model uh, is completely explained. I mean, Steve, you're, you're literally, you, you just gave us very specific business scenarios that um, I guess I've just not thought about before, and it just com makes complete total sense of why this team should probably be over here, uh, or let's continue that entrepreneurial, uh, you know, culture and, and so on and so forth. So th thank you for that. And I, I think kind of at the core of, of, of some of that is this um, perceived secret sauce, right? I mean, there's there's something about what WeWorks and others have done. I mean, I, I've worked out of these places my, myself and, yes, maybe uh, have partaken in the free beer. I'm, I'm not going to say if I did or didn't. But, um, you, you know, there, there's something to this. And I think um, – Maybe Ryan, you know, have you seen? Uh, I think I've heard it wasn't well, one of the uh, WeWork founders. They they started a business basically helping companies try to 
almost uh, mimic that environment in, in some of their workplace design? I mean, is that is there something about this sauce that just kind of fits certain uh, organizations? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I think it's important to think back why people started co-working in the first place, which is, you know, obviously it kind of started with people who work from home, independent workers, um, not really wanting to work from home, but not wanting to work at these service offices, service offices that were already on the market. Um, and I think it really kind of started by individuals coming together who wanted to have more of a personal connection with other people, even though they didn't have colleagues because um, they weren't working as an employee for companies. So, um, so kind of wanting that same camaraderie. And now what, what we're seeing, and you know, we, we've seen the evolution of co-working spaces tack on more, I guess, uh, kind of, I, I call it service. I, I guess, um, you know. We talk about community managers, you know, people who are throwing these fun events and, you know, getting to know the members, connecting people to each other. Um, but that's, in a lot of cases, what people sign up for when they go to a co-working space is they want to feel more uh, a part of a friend group, more of a, you know, have colleagues, meet other people that they can share interests with, whether that's professional or personal. Um, and I think that's, you know, when employees, especially some of these acquisitions, um, that, that corporates are doing, they want to locate inside of co-working spaces is because they want that kind of culture. They also want that startup culture where things feel a little bit more fun, a little more scrappy, less corporate. Um, and previous uh, and, and still existing service offices just really don't provide that, um, that kind of environment as much. Uh, so I think there is a secret sauce. I don't think I think you'll get a lot of argument from different co-working providers as to what that is and how if you can even produce it, <laughs> it yourself without it just happening yeah. organically. Um, but yeah, I mean I think a lot of it's driven by startup culture from Silicon Valley, um, driven by you know millennials coming into the workforce um, and kind of just the style of work that they that they want. Totally. No, I I was uh, my. Where I sit in the home office, we have a Newmark um, affiliate uh, about 35, 40 minutes from here, and they uh, they they uh, allowed me to to use their space, which was in a um, co-working facility run by Steelcase, <clears throat> yeah, or one of their one of their dealerships. And my my cell phone was was just blowing up throughout the week of different leftover food, or there's there's going to be a event for this this or that. I mean, yeah, there, there's definitely um, a uh, you know, community uh, feeling, and 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 that certainly has um, uh, attempted to be replicated by some of the large corporates. Um, I, I know it's, it's been um, e even our outsourced facilities model. When when we're talking about delivering facility management, I mean we're definitely talking about the use of more um, uh, experienced managers, um, not necessarily concierge. Uh, staff like you know but but more you know how, how are things going in terms of are, are you able to do what you need to do you know throughout the day do you have enough access to meeting space do you need additional technologies or tools or, or, or whatever and so at, at least I think because of this overall talent shortage we're not only uh, valuing our, our people more but we're certainly valuing space more um, but Ryan I want to ask you one other thing here so say you've got this thriving co-working center where they've definitely built their entrepreneurial community um, and then they get a knock on the door um, from from a big corporate um, you know we're, we're, we're seeing yeah. we're seeing again this this rise of corporates but what you know does, does every co-working operator say yay can't can't wait to have all that all that rent money <clears throat> yeah or, I mean they, uh, I think there's another a angle here <laughs> I think that yeah, there's uh, a few a few interesting points here. Um, one I wanted to quickly touch on, based on what you said before, um, was that also all of this community and and, and stuff. And you know, I love co-working. You know, a lot of it's, it's no secret, but uh, you know, all of this can also be very distracting for people. Um, and so, you know, uh, locating employees inside an open format office is lots of research has come out about open format offices uh, decreases in productivity and creativity. Uh, certainly increases in communication, but it does come with a sacrifice. So I just wanted to add that kind of based on what you were saying about getting all of these notifications about leftover food is that that can definitely be a distraction <laughs> for employees as well. Weigh, weigh that downside. 
Um, yeah, so I think that independent co-working spaces um, generally start as a way to kind of avoid this corporate culture, you know. Um, and so I think the, what goes through the minds of independent co-working spaces, you know, when I'm saying independent, I'm, I'm saying, you know, not WeWork, not Industrious, not Regis. Um, I wouldn't necessarily classify Regis as a co-working space, though, but um, the kind of small single location, maybe, maybe a small network within a city uh, co-working spaces. Um, but usually single location co-working spaces, um, that what kind of goes through their head when a corporate comes knocking is, yes, the money would be fantastic, um, but also we're not sure that we want to implement the infrastructure that you want. We don't want you to control the space. We So similar to um, what was being said about kind of NASDAQ locating in, in inside spaces, um, you know, one of the issues that corporates are going to have when they're dealing with independent co-working spaces is that they don't have uh, a great infrastructure. Often things are kind of hacked together, uh, for lack of a, a better term, um, which is also part of the fun of, you know, what goes with the feeling of these co-working spaces. Um, so there's definitely, a, it's, I feel like it's going to be more advantageous for, for corporates to work with more established, probably multi-location spaces that are really thinking about these kind of security protocols and infrastructure. Um, but a lot of independent co-working spaces just might not want the vibe that a corporate uh, entity is going to bring to the space, um, as well as the risk for co-working spaces is, is going to be having one single tenant or group of members take over a huge footprint within the space. Uh, that can be a huge risk. Uh, so you're probably not going to avoid signing a lease in that instance because they want the security. Because uh, if you're taking over 30% or 50% of the, the co-working space, they uh, you know that's a huge risk for them if if the corporate uh, if the corporate client decides to leave, then suddenly half the space is empty, uh, and it can easily put an independent co-working space out of business. Sure, no, it's, it was just kind of an interesting perspective. What what happens when your co-working facility says no? It's just uh, it, you know, and, and I think that's where it is. You know, culture really um, determines everything. I, I know you know Jacob. Morgan, uh, what, what, what some have called the single malt scotch of uh, workplace strategy, you know, always, always says that, uh, you know, any workplace experience, 40% is, is made up of, of that culture, which could certainly be the co-working center, but it's more of the corporate culture situation. It has about 30% is physical space. The remaining 30% can be the, you know, technology tool that you have at your desk or the, the, at home or whatever, and, and I, I, I think that drives a lot of these decisions. And, you know, going back to what Steve said, too, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons it makes sense, if you will. Um, let me um, go back here. Um, so part, part of all of this stuff, you know, what, what Steve was talking about in terms of NASDAQ and how they made a lot of their decisions to kind of go into these spaces or to keep folks there and maybe not move them hey, Dusty, fully in and so on and so forth. It, it, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Dusty, I'm sorry. Before you move on to that topic, we do have one yeah. question that I think is, is worthy of acknowledging. Uh, has there been a notable security breach in co-working spaces that has made the news? Great question. I'll defer to my panelists, maybe Ryan or Fred. Um, well, um, I, 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 I don't know off the top of my head, but yeah, maybe Fred knows. It didn't make the news. And the problem is with the operational technology side of things is there's not a reporting. Uh, they're not required to report. So a lot of times I'm involved with breaches and obviously I can't say who and that kind of thing, but um they're not required to report it. Now that's probably going to change at some point. The incident where I gave just a minute ago about the uh, printing to the printer, just for clarification, the printer was not a part of the work co-working space, and this building had co-working space, but, but it was in the parking garage and it was exposed publicly. So you can have the protection inside the shell if it's not in, inside, uh, but that doesn't mitigate that exposed printer that somebody got to remotely printed there's a bomb in the building and the whole building dumped. Yeah. I think that that also I points did. out a, an interesting point with co-working spaces just really quickly that, um, you know, a lot of times the 
the infrastructure is very much shared between the landlord and, and the, the co-working space who is really just a tenant of the landlord. So um, oftentimes co-working spaces aren't owning their own buildings. So, so really containing things inside this kind of yeah, security shell is, is actually very difficult for, for co-working space um, uh, providers because they, they actually don't have control over the entire infrastructure a lot of the time. Agreed. For sure. In fact, let let yeah, let me let me do this. Fred, while I've got you here, I'm I'm gonna skip ahead. Talk about what your company has done. I, I truly think this is kind of a maybe a new um service offering that we're we're gonna see some version of um more here, but you know, can can you guys get involved in, in coming out, uh whether it's on behalf of a NASDAQ or a co working operator or, or, or building owner but before they actually buy the building. Um and take some sort of inventory of, of the existing uh, setup. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to uh, the gentleman's point, just right when we were talking about the earlier event, is absolutely right. The building owners a lot of times don't know what they have. Uh, even if they haven't inherited it, if they've had it over these years, it's, it's just kind of mushroomed into a much more complex system. And there's no change management, no inventory. So real quick on what we've done is we foundationally built uh, an auditing process, process on NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. However, that is not an exact fit for building control systems because building control systems um, have a lot of nuances that an IT group doesn't have. And also, if, if you're familiar with ICS, uh, and real quick, quick definition, it's industrial control systems. That's oil and gas and power, uh, that type of thing. Building control systems are not ICS, although we're lumped into that um, that group. But even their standards and methodologies was not exactly uh, an exact fit for what we do. So what we've done is we've come up with a, a four-pronged approach uh, where we go in and do an audit on uh, and we've done them for military, commercial office space, hospitals, banks, uh, the list goes on. But essentially what happens is there is a pre-site visit where we uh, spend some time talking to the local people. We have a, a report uh, or an online assessment that they do of themselves. And that gives us the baseline of what we're dealing with. Then when we walk in the door, uh, there's usually two of us at least, depending on the size of it. and uh, we have guys that have uh, years and years of control system experience, and then we have network security guys. And we're only looking at the building control side, and we take a full inventory, we run network scans, we go look at the configurations of all the devices, and when it, when that's over with, we go back and put a, a report together with uh, the vulnerabilities, and then what are the mitigation uh, remediation steps for that, and then also, too, is the building owner has a full-on inventory, and then there's a, a best practices guide that goes along with that. Now, if the next level of this is uh, people obviously will say, well, how do I get started? I mean, what do I do? I can't eat this elephant all in one time. You absolutely can't. But there are some very basic things you can do, like find out if your systems are exposed to the web. There's internet search engines that all they do is look for exposed devices. One of them's called Shodan, another one's called Senses, and the Chinese have one called Zuma. And all they're doing all day long, 24-7, 365, is scanning the web to looking for devices. They are called the Google of, of IoT, I guess. If you get the, your systems where those search engines can't find you, then that's going to go a long way. The bad guys, are not, they're going to have a hard time finding you. The next thing is, is to uh, go through and do uh, an evaluation of your vendors and set up clear policies because I can tell you it's been my experience 100% of the time there is no clearly defined vendor uh, access policy or vendor policies in general. And then most of these systems, there's a single user that everybody uses. And even if you, someone gets fired, that user stays in the system. Well, uh, studies show somebody gets fired within 24 to 48 hours is when they're going to come back and do some damage. But that's – and you just do those few things, it's, you're going to be miles ahead of your competition. 
huge. I, it's it's a new day and age, folks. I mean, honestly, uh, the fact that we got to be concerned about this, it, it, it's um, it's a little mind boggling. I was again managing buildings 15 years ago, and I we wouldn't even think about this stuff, right? So, um, thank you, Fred. That's that's huge. I, I think with all of this stuff, we're we're about out of time. I, I want to um, just go back a slide here and just say uh, all of this stuff, right? Whether you are an entrepreneurial uh, startup, <clears throat> you are a um, enterprise organization, um, you know, you 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 really want to uh, have a strategy on all of this stuff, right? Um, we we look at it as kind of this again enterprise optimization. You know, why why do you even want certain types of employees in this location? Because it's probably higher cost, right? So maybe you want to outsource um, your your call center or your service center and move it over to this part of the United States. And again, maybe that would sit in a co working environment. Maybe may, maybe not. But um, there, there's there's reasons for all of this stuff in terms of do we own? Do we lease? What kind of uh, information management do we want to control? Um, you know, how are we setting up our theory organizational design? What is our overall workplace strategy and how does technology enable that? So, I, you know, that's just kind of a high level of what I think a lot of us go through when we're looking at all of these options. Um, so with that said, um, I, I do want to see if there's any um, any last questions or Maura, if you want to chime in at all as, as well uh, on this. Well, this has been fascinating. I really love hearing the stories, and um, you know, I appreciate some of the the, the question the question that came through um, already from from David and Chad. Thank you for your feedback on on the content. This team has um, been practitioners in this field and and um, also you know experiencing it in real time. So this has been um, you know an evolving, as you said, evolving. Uh, scenario um, that people are trying to navigate, navigate both within um, third party space as well as, you know, to a certain extent trying to manage that within their own managed environment and the challenges posed there as they try to to um, make sure everyone stays productive and secure and, and um, working efficiently. Um, if, if there's any other questions, feel free to put it on the chat. Um, any final words from the rest of our panelists? Um, I just wanted to add because I, I don't know that we really got through a lot of uh, very, uh, you know, ways ways forward, I guess, with, uh, you know, corporates and, and also corporate real estate and kind of, you know, co-working. I think, you know, for a while, the two sides have kind of been coming towards each other uh, for the last several years. And that's really exciting to see, uh, you know, a lot more interest from the corporate side into, you know, what's going on in co-working. Uh, but I just wanted to suggest that, you know, ways that... Uh, uh, corporates can work better with with these co-working providers. You know, a lot of co-working providers don't typically have the resources um, that they need, and they don't really know have the business know-how. Uh, but they do bring the table uh, bring to the table the kind of the community bits that you're looking for, and also the the service that the that they're able to provide. You know, you know, kind of facilitating events and collaboration. And so, if that's kind of what you're looking for, if that's why you're interested in co-working, um, I'd encourage your company to, or whether you're with a, a real estate company or if you're you know, a corporate yourself, then um, really think about how you can uh, be a partner to some of these co-working providers, um, provide the some of the support and financial backing, um, and then let them kind of run with the the service part of it. Um, so I, I think that every corporate, there's a lot of corporates getting in there, starting their own innovation hubs, their own co-working brands, uh, big real estate groups like British Land starting their own co-working flexible office space. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in this, um, and the people who are the most experienced in the co-working side of things uh, are already out there. Um, I, they obviously won't work for free, but uh, I, I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity to reach out to them and, and kind of bridge the gap even further. Um, and if anybody wants to reach out and, and chat more about that, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you. Uh, yeah, and we do have one more question. Um, uh, are there any new trends on the horizon in co-working? Um, I could so one of the things. Sorry, yeah, one, one of the things yeah, ahead, I've experienced uh, the last one of the things I've experienced the last six months is I've seen a lot of landlords promoting their buildings when trying to lease space, but they also are white labeling co-working spaces in the building. So in essence, they may dedicate two or three floors 
that allows a corporate to take space but then also measure and sort of build for the future through their co-working options. So that's one trend that sort of come to me that I've noticed in the last six to 12 months. Uh, the trends yeah. that, that wow. we're noticing from the co-working side are, are really um, obviously the corporates coming more into the space, more corporate real estate. Um, that's that's one of the biggest ones we've noticed. Uh, but the other really big one is uh, niches, niche workspaces. So you're seeing co-working and flexible workspaces for uh, all kinds of industries. Um, you know, from you know labs, science labs to um, you know food co-working spaces, shared restaurant spaces. Um, it's kind of touching touching everything. So it's uh, the nichification, uh, for lack of a better word, is is something we're seeing a lot. Um, I just saw um, a question come in from Tristy. Um, I can I can kind of address it. Are there metrics available on the cost to develop these types of environments and experiences in the corporate workplace? Um, I, I you know, the, again, there are some folks who have kind of come from this background and are trying to replicate this in the corporate environment or just general. Uh, Architects, workplace strategists, and so on and so forth that have um, that, that are bringing certain attributes into their uh, environments. I, I don't necessarily know directly um, what the costs of, of some of uh, that might be. I don't know if any of my typical consulting uh, fees I would I would imagine, but um, yeah. Again, and maybe to uh, yeah. point, they're kind of you know white labeling certain. I mean, I think you can find, um, I mean, some of the consultants I know that are, you know, kind of doing the, um, I'm not sure from like a architecture outfitting uh, perspective, but if you're looking at having someone kind of set up a co-working space for you and uh, like run it for a while, some of the offers that I've heard of from co-working consultants, like who are work actually doing real consulting, not just kind of these small people doing it, um, as well as WeWork, who's also doing uh, co-working consulting and fit-outs now. Um, I think that, you know, somewhere between, this was in Europe, so I want to say like between 27 and 40 euros a square foot or something like this. Um, and I think this is per month to manage for a year or something like this, but I'd have to double check my, my numbers, but yeah. And that's not, that doesn't include obviously the, the cost of the fit-out. Sure. Sure, and and a uh, chief expands here to say an attempt to put a financial value on on culture and community in the workplace. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of that. What what I have, what what we've been involved in uh, with some of our technology partners is, you know, I think historically corporate real estate facilities have, have looked at that cost per square foot, right? And so when we're talking about uh, new occupancy planning to um, either uh, can, can contract overall square footage and save on uh, you know a few dollars per square foot on energy, or maybe yes, yeah, save a few uh, dollars or thirty plus square feet on on rent. What we're talking about and why I think a lot of people are are drawn to these spaces is there's it's usually a little bit higher tech. There's uh, maybe a mobile app in the space that allows you to reserve conference rooms or um, you know order food or or put yourself in a line at a restaurant downstairs and, and, and all of this stuff that, that enables higher productivity. And that's where we're, we're, we're really attacking that um, from, from a salary standpoint or that, that cost of the employee per square foot maybe is $300 per square foot number or 500 or in Fortune 100 firms maybe $2,000. Um, and then looking at what the revenue potential of that employee is, I mean, that's, that's where we're I'm seeing a, a much larger business case around a better strategy that that um, definitely impacts the employee experience. Again, just to tout Jacob Morgan, um, his latest book of the Employee Experience Advantage, he definitely gets into some metrics. He did a study of about 250 companies, and um, he was able to see direct correlations. Uh, companies that are investing in that experience are outperforming from a profit standpoint, from a um, definitely from a salary standpoint, um, stock price. I mean, there, there's absolutely some some really real data out there. So I uh, would be happy to follow up if uh, anybody's interested in that. So I think from here we're about three minutes over the hour, but I definitely appreciate everybody's time. I don't know if Nicole or Maura want to sign us out, but uh, it's been a pleasure.
No, I think I think we're good. And um, thank you again to our panelists. What a great discussion, the wonderful interaction. Thank you to our, um, the, those that attended and provided some really good questions um, and, and all your feedback. I, I put the link to our chapter page from LinkedIn in the chat. Um, I've also reached out to a number of you on LinkedIn and look forward to continuing the conversation. And um, stay tuned for our next webinar in a couple of months. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks again. Thank you.